Hello and welcome back to the Argyle HR Leadership Forum. My name is Brittany Sullivan with Argyle and it's great to have everyone joining us today. A couple of notes before I turn things over to our panel moderator. First, a quick reminder to stop by our sponsors virtual booths at any time during today's event and for the following week. Our partners are committed to providing you with valuable content and a great overall experience. At any time during today's event, you can visit their virtual booths from the main agenda page, which include complimentary materials, information, and meet and greet opportunities. To ask questions throughout the session, simply type into the Q&A chat, and we will address your questions at the end of the session. Now, without further delay, I would love to introduce our moderator, Todd Allen, Corporate Director of Human Resources at Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission. We're excited to have Todd and our panelists with us for a panel titled, Oh, the Humanity, Transformative HR Technologies, AI and Beyond. Welcome, Todd, and over to you. Oh, great, thanks so much. I am uh, happy to be a moderator with this great panel. I'd like them to introduce themselves. So I'm gonna turn it right over to Rebecca Warren to kick off the introductions. All right. Hello, everyone. Rebecca Warren. I uh, currently work at Eightfold AI. Uh, I've been there about three and a half years. Started out in customer success and helped build that customer success team and now have recently moved over to a new practice that we're starting called Talent uh, Centered Transformation, where we're building a practice Talent, uh, around where we're building a practice around talent rather than jobs. Um, I'm based out of Phoenix, job. Arizona. Based out of Phoenix, Arizona. Okay, great. Let's go to Lauren next. All right, I'm not hearing Lauren, so let me go to Savannah next. Hi, I am Savannah Skinner. I am a director of human resources over the resources over the over the human resources business partner team for air methods yeah. i've been working in hr for about 15 HR. years You've got and, a weird echo sorry <laughs> yes um i've worked in a variety of industries starting with the army the alcohol industry and currently working in healthcare i'm happy to be here. okay great and lauren uh comes to us with quite a bit of experience. Lauren, I can give a quick intro for you if you're, uh, unless you want to try one more time. Try one more time. All right. So Lauren, oh yes, Lauren, please. So Lauren, oh yeah. Hi, I'm, I'm Vice President of People for Tista Science and Technology. We're in high contracting. Great. Great. Okay. So our first question for the panelists. So our first question, I am hearing an echo. So if our, our uh, uh, behind the scenes team can check on that, please feel free to introduce uh, a solution. Uh, nevertheless, I'm going to jump right into our first question. What are some of the ways that technology is changing the role of HR professionals? Let's start with Rebecca. Yeah, I think it is changing HR's role significantly. Uh, I think talent intelligent systems, talent intelligence systems like Eightfold are transforming the talent journey from pre-hire to retire, adding AI, machine learning, automation to make the best talent uh, surface more quickly and more easily. Um, I think there's other things out there like data uh, driven decision making tools such as like Power BI or Tableau, allowing HR professionals to gather data and make um, predictive decisions, analyzing patterns and trends, um, enhancing communication and uh, remote work facilitation, um, and then also employee engagement platforms. I think that process has changed significantly and I think tech is making that better. Um, also, e-learning platforms and training that's done through um, VR and AR, especially where it's not possible for trainers to be everywhere, using uh, virtual reality and augmented reality makes a big difference for folks. So there's a laundry list, but those are a couple of things that I think about in terms of making um, HR's role more impactful 
by using technology to take away the work that uh, used to be um, time consuming and allow those HR professionals to become more talent advisors as opposed to being stuck in the weeds. I love it. And I love that you start with talent intelligence. Thank you. Uh, let's, let's go next to Lauren and then Savannah. the speed in which our businesses are operating for HR professionals to use that data and information in order to grow our team where, where, where it's all going. I think it's such an exciting time to be in HR. I think more than ever, we've had a seat at the table, not that we don't have to fight for it in some organizations, but I think HR is valued more than it has been in the past. And we have the access to data to drive intelligent intelligent decisions. That's cool. You, you guys also remind me of, I think it was the cover of a recent Sherm magazine when Jan, Johnny Taylor said, AI plus HI equals ROI. So it really emphasizes how Rebecca kicked off with human intelligence, you know, partnering with AI um, to, to get the best ROI. So thank you for sharing that. Let's go a little deeper. Uh, the next question, um, we're gonna drill a little more into AI and the differentiation between generative AI technologies like ChatGPT and other AI applications. How is generative AI changing the role of HR professionals? Let's start with Rebecca again. Yeah, thanks. Belonging to an AI company, uh, we have to know a little bit about this. And I'm going to take a step back before I actually answer that question. And I want to talk about really briefly the different types of AI, what it is and what it isn't, right? And so a lot of times people think AI is automation, but automation is just taking and, and making a task easier with minimal human intervention. Um, an algorithm is a set of instructions designed to perform a specific task. Uh, then we've got Gen AI, which is AI systems that create new content such as text or images, music or code. Um, we also then have large language models, which is a type of AI focused on understanding and generating human language. And then we have AI, uh, which is the simulation of human intelligent processes by machines, especially computer systems. So I think there's a lot of flavors to it. And there's a lot of times we think it's this or it's that. And there's a lot of different levels. When I think about Gen AI and how it's changing, right, so it can create new content um, and build things, um, I think it's great for us to, as a thought starter, I love to use it to think about job descriptions or uh, looking at answering questions on a webinar, give me some ideas to think about, right? Um, so Gen AI is changing because it is systems that create content that tend to emulate humans. And so as we think about using Gen AI, making sure though that um, you're using it in a way that you've got some frameworks around it. And I think we'll talk more about that as we go along about how do we make sure that we're safe when we're using AI. But I think as we spend some time looking at Gen AI, using it to make our lives easier, I recommend using it as a thought starter for HR professionals. How would I answer this question? How would I think about it? But then also proofing your answer by using some additional information um, using Google or uh, your experts around you. Excellent. All right, let's do Lauren and then Savannah again. Thanks, Ted. I would add, you know, as it generates thoughts or it helps our candidates with their resume writing skills, we're also using it in our interviewing capabilities. Um, and we have to really be mindful of security, right? Ensuring that um, great resumes, great talent is able to come to the organization, is a cultural fit, and that we're addressing those biases. We're using it um, at Air Methods to generate job postings, like little LinkedIn blurbs about different opportunities and generate um, more traffic to recs that we have out there. We also use it for internal communications and have started trying to figure out how to use it for things like employee handbooks and policies, just to try to make those mundane tasks a little bit easier. 
That's great. Yeah, I was thinking I've, I've been dabbling with it. Policies can be a challenge sometimes, especially uh, we've had some recent legislation in Maryland having called the Time to Care Act and drawing down thinking around that I was playing and, and it helped me get started. But then the proofing piece was so important and, uh, you know, kind of then doing my normal policy work with the other stakeholders to customize things. So so great points. Um, fault starter proofing and um that, that's that I think opens up really to probably helping every area of HR. All right, uh, we'll drill a little deeper again with the next question um, that kind of builds on what we just said. So let's just uh, open this up. Uh, are there any other non-generative uses of AI for HR that you feel we didn't cover in our last uh, last response? Anything you want to add? I'll start with Rebecca, just in case you want to, since you, you were very thorough, do you do you, anything that maybe we might have missed that you want to add to that? Well, I think we'll get to this a little bit further down the road, but there was a question that came in um, around outside of recruiting, what other aspect of HR do you feel AI will be most useful? And honestly, when I think about our role at Eightfold, right, our mission statement is helping everyone find the right career, right, the right career for everyone in the world. And so where I see AI becoming so helpful is moving things along more quickly, right? When I think about um, helping folks find new jobs, and I'm case in point, right? I came to Eightfold with a TA background, TA practitioner for a long time, but did not know customer success and did not know tech. And But because I had those transferable skills, the system was able to say, yes, this looks like a good fit. I was referred over, but then when I put my resume in and it says, hey, here's jobs that would match for you, it came up with TA, but it also came up with customer success. So I think the ways that AI is making connections, not just in recruiting, but internal mobility. How do we help folks stay in an organization instead of leaving? And so what kind of skills adjacencies can tech AI help us uncover using talent intelligence to connect those dots, do it more quickly, and make those connections in ways that we might not think about, right? If you think about um, teachers are great fits for consultants, but that doesn't feel like a normal connection. So using AI to help make those internal mobility uh, changes or getting into a completely different career path, I think AI is huge for doing that and helping connect those dots in ways that we might not normally think about. That, that's awesome. Um, how, about, how about Lauren and Savannah? Anything you'd like to add? Lauren first. Dots is well important and using the automation systems integrations to really help us in analyzing information. That's informed decision organization to support just attracting them and bringing them into the organization. But as Rebecca mentioned, helping career staying with the organization. All about harnessing that data and what's awesome savannah anything else you'd like to add i think they they covered it well but i'll just is this when i think about non-generative ai and hr i think of data analytics talent reviews talent talent planning and succession planning i think those are areas where we can make an impact okay very cool um, I'll just throw this out real quick, too. At my last company, I was chief HR and chief strategy and innovation officer. And uh, it was kind of intriguing after after 30 years of like HR traditional work to be thrown into like being almost like a chief information officer that was more low code and more creating innovation, partnering with the CIO. So it was, it was kind of a, a strange um, next level thing for me. And it caused me to get into the business. And we always use the buzzword people, process, tech, data and people first, but kind of that balance. And uh, we got into like predictive modeling using AI to predict like sewer overflows. We were a water wastewater industry. So it was like, you were like, hmm. But by not having as many sewer overflows, it helped the work life, the workers. That was the worst thing to do, as you can imagine, uh, having to get deployed on an emergency in the middle of the night to clean up a sewage overflow and the community hated it. So the AI modeling said, hey, if we predict heavy rainfall coming in, it's likely that this 
is going to happen here with this kind of various factors. And so we want to do something a little differently in terms of how we operate and then we avoid that. And now we don't have to have the number of emergency calls and the emergency calls went down. So there's this deep relationship to, to uh, you know, the business's use of AI as well impact, in my opinion, on how we define the jobs and, um, you know, some of, some of the, the really weird things that are more emergencies, we might be able to predict and avoid the emergencies. So that's just kind of an interesting example from my last company. Yeah. All right, next question, we'll start with Savannah. How do you ensure that humans are always in the loop of important decisions? I think this is this is such an interesting concept. And I think HR is in an interesting place because we not only are in the position to use AI and, and new technologies, we also have the responsibility as gatekeepers of liability and, and safeguarding the organization. And then I think even ensuring that data is used ethically. So I think the the solution to this is to make sure that you have checks and balances built into your processes where humans are, are playing an active role in identifying the way that the data is used, making sure it's used ethically and in compliance and not not letting anything, uh, any technology operate too independent of human judgment. I think it's a good starting place, but I don't think that um, we should rely entirely on technology. Yeah, Great. I agree. And I'll just jump in. Is that okay, Todd? Yeah, please. Because <laughs> I, I think you've known by now, I'm not afraid to, you know, chat about things. <laughs> um, so to tack on that, Savannah, I think you're 100%. And I think there's transparency that needs to happen, but there's also education. And I think HR professionals need to know what AI is in their processes and understand it to the best of their ability. Now, I'm not saying that you need to go down and figure out how to code um, or create, you know, um, an algorithm or anything like that. But understanding like explainable AI is really important. And that's something that we pride ourselves on at Eightfold is that we can explain it, how it works, in general and i think that's important for hr professionals to understand what that looks like that explainable ai um, and then also making sure that you're holding vendors accountable to as you said savannah make sure that there aren't things built into the system that you don't want to know about right so what are your vendors doing to prevent bias to add that um that human connection making sure that your AI uh, systems are not making decisions that should be made by humans. There should always be that human oversight. Okay, great. Uh, Lauren, anything you'd like to add? Okay, great. Uh, Lauren, you'd like to add? Yeah, just I think in the collaboration, not losing the collaboration, AI generates that there's that cross pollination is really quite important. In, it's all about humans. Yeah, great point. Yeah, yeah I think uh, we we can we can think through our uh, we, we workflow. Can, we... Sorry if there's an echo, so I'll, I'll I'll leave it at that. Except the workflow that we design, you know, making sure the the human steps. So you know, technology is doing its thing, and then we make decisions about how the human uh, takes the step and oversees, improves, or whatever, and then pushing it back out and, um, and so on. But I love, you know, it's kind of the general theme of checks and balances. All right, Savannah, for the next question first, how do you keep up with the training needs that new technologies create? I think with everything, just like everything that we do, there's there's some change management involved. And I think it starts with identifying the, the, the gap in knowledge where people are at today and where we need them to be. And I think Rebecca raised some, some really interesting points with explainable AI. I think that's that's a, a really good way to put it. Um, if, if you understand what it's supposed to do, then you can also help identify what you need your people to understand, right processes around it. And at, at least for me throughout my career, when there's been new technology, I often have one person or maybe a couple of people who are just excited about it. And that's something that fits really well with their passions and their preferences. So I like to let them be a pioneer, give, empower them to learn the technology and help figure out what the right process is and help bring the rest of the team, team along. But if you've got that one change maker, empower them and let them run with it. 
Love it. Um, Rebecca, Lauren, you want to build on that? Well, I love what you said. We call those champions. We love pulling those into uh, our technology, right, and have them try it out. What do you like? What don't you like? So I love saying that, you know, get that experimentation, getting folks involved early. Um, I think there's there's that con- – one of the things that I find really interesting, and some of our clients are doing this, is the micro learning, right? So how do you take little bite-sized pieces and put it together? So breaking down your content into bite-sized units as opposed to saying we're going to learn all of the things, right? So putting together um, spaces where it's easy for folks to be able to um, learn it, but it doesn't feel overwhelming, um, and then giving regular updates. I'm a just-in-time learner. You give me a whole laundry list of stuff, and I'm like, I'll look at it later. And guess what? I never look at it later, right? So giving it to me just in time in bite size is easier to keep up on technology than like, here, take this seven-hour course on AI. Like nobody wants to do that, right? So how do you make it um, bite size? But I also think you have to make it personalized as well. You have to, in order for folks to feel like they're coming along on the journey, um, tailor those training programs, right? Depending on what departments you're in or what you need to know, making sure that there's some customized learning. Um, and, and Savannah, spot on, right? That skill gap analysis, understanding uh, where people might have a gap in their understanding and then how do you bring them along? But again, doing it in a customized way so it doesn't feel like peanut butter, but it feels like we care enough about you to give you that customized um, understanding and training. That I, I love that point because then then you're it, you, now you're not just forcing new technology or something you're developing your people you're teaching them a new skill and that's something to get excited about and how you manage the the change I think there's an internal marketing aspect to a lot of what we do and these things love it awesome and then Lauren I had a chance to talk a little bit prior to today about a little bit use of an AI today, competency model use of an AI can you talk a little bit of that, share a little bit of that with us, Lauren? There we go. As a government contractor, so we're constantly seeking to understand our clients as well as those emerging tech needs. And so we're a competency model that OP recently released and specific training, both for TISTA and just these subject matters um, with the great investment in an in not every organization but finding those ways to whether it's skills analysis But we, we lost Lauren for a minute there. I'll just tell her, um, you know, we're also going to throw things in the chat or come back to it. But she has shared with me that uh, her organization uh, has um, tapped into an AI, AI competency model. And I thought that was intriguing. I'm not there yet. So I'm learning today as well. But I, I think, think that sounded really, really cool. Um, and the other comments are spot on. I think, you know, we're, we're constantly trying to address, you know, our diverse workforce and uh, diff- different ways to reach them with micro learning, um, you know, different e-learnings, customized learning, and, um, you know, kind of kind of following up. I also think sometimes we're going through bids now. Um, I'm a kind of public sector agency. So when I go through bids, uh, we have very strict procurement rules, but we'll put into our requirement gathering some of these things we're talking about. So we receive that information. We kind of have a sense of, of how our partner would operate in these spaces and uh, such as even the training, you know, how do we operate and have bidders kind of explain my, how might they be using AI and, um, you know, what, what might they recommend? So right out of the gate of bringing in new technology, uh, we, we've kind of factored that into our evaluation process. So I thought I'd slip that in. Okay, next question. We'll start with Rebecca. How can HR leaders <clears throat> use technology to improve employee experiences? Okay, that's a huge question, and uh, there's lots of answers. Um, so, so let me start with saying that employee experiences. When we think about tech, right? We think about 
um, what an employee career path looks like. So there's lots of ways to improve employee experiences. So the first thing I'll talk about just as in general, right? Um, transparency with communication, easier to connect with folks, using feedback and engagement apps, putting those out there. It's easier for folks to communicate back and forth. Um, of course, using your, your LMS, your learning management system, making sure that there's personalized career journeys in there. Um, and then HR processes, right, streamlining, uh, the processes by giving self-service portals, easier for folks to find their information, automating some of the workflows, easier for folks to, to dig into things. Um, but I also want to talk about career paths, right? And what does that look like? Um, when the employee experience, when you come into an organization and you're like, yay, I'm excited, I'm here, right? I'm ready to go, I'm the champion. And then if you don't have people pouring into you or spending time understanding what's important to you and what you want to do, that excitement tends to fade. You've got folks that maybe are um, not as engaged as they, as they could be. So I think using tech to improve that experience um, in a way that improves transparency. How can you be more transparent about what a career journey could look like? Uh, how do you change from a career ladder to a chessboard or a lattice? How do you allow folks to learn about opportunities inside the organization, get matched to some of those opportunities, and then be able to either pursue that as their next role or put together um, a project marketplace where folks can say, hey, I wanna learn more about what's going on in tech, but I don't necessarily maybe wanna move from HR into tech. So is there a project that I could add my um, experience to what could I learn from that? How do we help employees feel more connected to the organization through transparency of career paths and also what's happening um, at the top? I think there's a lot of tools that help, like I said earlier, build that communication. And I think transparency overall from an organizational perspective, I think a lot of times um, employees feel like, I don't know what's happening. I don't know where things are coming from or why are our leaders making that decision? So opening up that, that um, you know, the doors to, to Willy Wonka's kingdom, right? Like letting people see behind the curtain. Um, what does that look like? Um, I think that makes employees feel more connected to the organization and more willing to invest when they feel like the company is investing in them. Technology helps do that more quickly and more broadly um, than I think we've done in the past. Love it. I might steal the project marketplace idea. I've thought about that in the past to just um, have had trouble pulling it off. Effectively. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's go to Savannah. Anything you'd like to add on uh, uh, the employee experience? Yeah, so I'll just add one one thought. I think in general, it 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 can free up our HR teams. I, maybe I'll back up. We're all limited resources, right? So there's only so much we can do with the the amount of time that we have and energy and resources. So if we can find ways to be more efficient and and automate what can be automated, then we have more time, more bandwidth to do more strategic things. And I think that that has a direct impact on the employee experience. 100%. Yeah. I also really appreciate yeah. like thinking about also the really life appreciate. cycle, like hire to retire and uh, how to personalize these journeys uh, can be super intriguing to build that out. Uh, okay, great. Let's go right to the next question. Uh, okay, great. Lauren Let's go right to the next question. How can HR leaders use technology to How improve recruiting HR leaders and talent acquisition? To improve recruiting Lauren? and talent acquisition. Lauren? Sure. I hope you all can hear me. We're really trying to use technology to assess it as someone comes into the organization. So using these and active listening, really thinking about the work, um, understanding work-life balance, understanding wellness. Um, really just constant learners to our organization and with us and having our hiring way so that they're identifying those individuals that want to learn and grow with us and that the adaptable, right? Where we're not just experienced, 
but we're able to learn in these new technologies and these new environments that we're working in. Awesome. Thanks for sharing. Rebecca Savannah. Thanks for sharing. I think that was a great answer. <laughs> All right, we you nailed it. Okay, let's let's go ahead to the next question then. How can we make sure that we're not baking biases into our HR technology? So I think sometimes we we have thought that technology is inherently not biased, but I think that that's not true. As as humans, we have a bias, and then the people writing the algorithms and creating the technology also have a bias, and so there is inherently bias to it. So the same issue that we have with people of us needing to be aware of our biases and how that can influence things like the way that candidates are screened. Um, I think if you train your programmers and, and folks involved on the creation of the process, uh, creation of the algorithms to recognize biases and work to make sure that those, those um, that you have equity and inclusivity in, in mind when you're writing those processes along with diversity in the way that you're sourcing candidates. I think that that is how you can be mindful and aware. And again, with um, some of the other questions, have human involvement throughout the process and teach your people on inherent bias and, and try to hit that head on. I think that's how we can avoid it. But technology in and of itself is not sufficient to avoid bias. It needs training and DEI strategy. Let me jump in on a quick comment. You, you triggered something. I've seen this happen over my 35 year career. Frequently, uh, one CEO will say, we got to emphasize degree required, degree required, degree required. And, and some even went highly inappropriate and said, you know, I love Harvard or I love this or I love that. I'm like, what are you talking about? And I try to change that mindset, but a lot of them had very fixed bias and mindset. Then they would leave and Nucio would come and say, I think, you know, we need to be more inclusive. And, and just in a matter of one CO to the next day and Nucio, we would, we would rework uh, uh, lots of things. And, um, and we see that kind of showing up lots of different ways throughout um, human decision making, but that, I always think that that example pops in my mind. This degree required versus uh, how we utilize various experiences and um, and so on. But let's go. Let's go to Rebecca. Anything you'd like to add on that topic of the biases? Yeah, I think Savannah is absolutely spot on. Right, we need to have that human intervention. And when we think about the information that we're using to build those um, those systems we need to make sure we have inclusive data sets, right? So if you put garbage data in, you're gonna get garbage data out. So if you have inclusive data sets that's training that model over and over and over and continuing to monitor it to make sure that if there is a space for bias to get in, then it's pulled out, that makes a big difference. So you have to make sure that the information that you're training, and it's a continual training, right? You think about the model that Eightfold uses. We are an AI native platform. We had the AI before we had the solution to what we were gonna use it to solve for. So our system has been learning and growing and training itself for over six years. So if you think about some of these tools that come in and they say that they have AI, but they, you, they can't tell you about their data set or they are very new to the space, you have to be a little more vigilant because their AI hasn't had enough time to learn and to grow and to um, develop the right path. So a lot of monitoring needs to come into that. Um, and one other thing I wanted to throw in there as well, Todd, so you talked about, again, what data you put in is what data you get out. So if you say, hey, a degree required is the, the be all and end all, and then you've got somebody else who comes in and says, hey, no, this is based on they have to work at these companies. Right. I think when we talk about moving to a skills based process where it's not based on your particular background, it's not based on this, it's not based on that, it's based on skills and what people bring to the table. When we move from a job centered, here's the laundry list of things we need in a job description. When we move to here's what somebody has done and how they can benefit the organization, it also takes some of that bias out because it's then not based on what school you went to, what your title was, what company you worked for. Um, you can find that talent that maybe doesn't have a company that has a 
recognizable name, but somebody has done amazing work. So you take away that bias by putting in the focus on skills as opposed to a resume or a background and paying attention to what that potential is. So AI um, absolutely will be able to, to do that and pulling out some of that bias as well. Like, oh, they, they went to this school or they did that. It's taking out that, that bias as well. Awesome. Now this, um, see if you want to build on this, I, I'm, I'm starting to follow uh, audience questions now. As we, as we start to wind down, we'll, we'll increasingly go to the audience questions. So there was a question posed a moment ago for talent acquisition. How do you use generative AI or an ATS to limit biases in the resume screening process? Maybe Rebecca first or Savannah. Savannah, you got something. Why don't we go with you first? Yeah, go ahead, Savannah. It's, sorry, it's kind of reiterating what I said, but it's it's the way that the the algorithms, the way that the, the product is written. But I also think I want to hit this home. It's we need to source diverse candidates. I think you have to think about the different avenues in which candidates are learning or potential candidates are learning about your roles. And if those aren't diverse, if you're not targeting a variety of colleges, um, then for example, or not colleges at all, different different kinds of websites and, and resources where a number of different kinds of candidates are going to get to, then you, you won't have a diversity in your talent process, diversity in your talent process. Yeah, I love it. Thinking about sourcing and the applicant pool. About sourcing and Let me go to Lauren. Pool. Lauren? Just continual for you, right? It's one thing if you fill because I have those candidates, but what's the impact of the tool and making sure that you're measuring that it's not screening out that diverse inclusion factor. Exactly. And that's where I was saying, if you go down to that skill level and you focus on that rather than a name or a specific school, Savannah, to your point, you have to have that inclusive data set to train your model so that it knows that we're going to focus on these things instead of those things. But I absolutely believe your AI can learn and produce the right people based on skills um, when you are pulling in the right information. And that helps you make the best talent decision as opposed to the most comfortable talent decision. Okay. And, um, and to kind of wrap up our, our formal question, Savannah, is there anything else you'd like to add about pursuing DEI goals and how technology helps? Anything you'd like to add to your last comment? No, I feel like I've hit that. Uh, I'll, I'll let Lauren and Rebecca chime in. All right. Well, well, I have a thought on that. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Todd. Well, just because we only have a few minutes left, I, I was going to jump right into some questions that are populating up. Um, but if you want to go real quick, Rebecca, feel free. I just have one thought there. So as I was talking about that skills-based uh, organization, right? If you're focusing on skills, DEI becomes embedded in how you work and part of your culture. And it doesn't have to be a separate department because you're focusing on the skills, you're moving more to an equitable playing field, and you can then make DEI part of that table stakes culture. It's built into everything you do because you've already focused on the right things as opposed to um, looking at things that might inherently cause bias. So that was just my two cents there. Cool. Rebecca, I'm going to hit you up with this question. See if you can uh -oh. go a little deeper on this. How do you differentiate between AI and an algorithm? It really seems similar just adding a layer of teaching it to act more human or try things when creating building. Right. So it depends on why you want to figure out what the difference is. But when you think about an algorithm, it is a code-based uh, system. It's designed to produce results repeatedly. So when you think about AI, it's meant to imitate humans. An algorithm isn't meant to imitate a human. If you think about a Boolean search, that's really an algorithm that you are creating. So an algorithm really is just a set of restrictions to produce an end result, whereas AI holistically is meant to imitate how humans would think and react and respond. So it depends on why you want to know the difference, but um, an algorithm is more like a keyword search and AI is more like thinking like a human, if we think about it that way. Love it. That's, that's super helpful. 
All right. Um, let's let's hit this one. What strategies are you leveraging to bring employees along with HR on the AI journey? There's a lot of concern and a decided lack of information or bad information influencing general opinion. Anybody want to take that one? I think this is a piece of what I view as the change management strategy with all of this. I think we have to put just like any change, their change is scary. I think you have to explain the why, the value that there is for the company, the the why for the people, the individuals themselves, how it changes their role and um, be transparent. Um, I like the, the Willy Wonka uh, analogy where <laughs> you share the information that you can that's appropriate to share. Um, and I think hitting hitting change head on with something inspirational and something a bit vulnerable and getting people excited is, is the key to those things. Yeah. And I would add to that. I think you have to tie it back to what your organization is trying to accomplish. What is the ROI for it? What is it going to allow you to do? As you said, Savannah, how is it going to help me? Right. There's, there's a lot of with them. We want to know what's in it for me. Um, how is that going to help my job? How is that going to help the company be more successful? I don't think anybody wants to go to work to suck and nobody wants to go to work for uh, an organization that can't succeed. And so when we understand what technologies are in place and why we're using them, understand it and then continue to build on that. Here's what it's going to do for you. Here's what it's going to do for the company overall with the goal of being successful. It feels less scary and less like somebody's going to take my job. I think that's the biggest thing I hear is AI is taking over the world. It's going to take my job. No, it's going to take the work off your plate or it may replace your job, but we're going to give you something better, right? It's going to take away the work that feels non-value added for a human to do and make you into a better person with the goal of elevating not only your employees, but also your organization. Awesome. Lauren, anything you'd like to add here? Here. Just embrace Empower yourself. Always help change or new technology back to, you know, when the auto industry was going from to and machines, there's always going to be change and you're going to find new ways to. Yeah, that's great. I think there's a lot of fundamental change management principles that come into play with a lot of this, getting out and having open communication, honest communication. Uh, I have had times where I implemented like robotic process automation, you know, years ago. And that mere concept was like, our customer service agents were like, oh my God, is HR guy coming in trying to fire us? And I'm like, I got the blessing from the CEO. No one will be fired. In fact, our game plan is to upskill. Here's exactly what we're going to do. Exactly. Right now you have this 25 step process you sit, the customer sits on hold for 30 minutes while you, you work through this together. Now you can intake this through maybe a digital process, have a nice conversation with the customer and push a button and the bot kind of will process all this stuff and it'll be done. Uh, and, and the backlog will go from this massive horrifying number um, to, to uh, down to zero uh, and, and we can upskill and kind of lattice back to succession planning. You know, a lot of, a lot of people I found in like customer service had this fear. And then when we engage them over time, over, over workforce planning, we could say, yeah, you're right. We, we will need a few less positions over the next three years. And so we're going to engage you. And we found all these people with transferable skills, like people that worked at banks and said, would you rather also be interested in like getting trained to do billing, which is a higher job than the call center agent? So there was a lot of engagement and custom conversations. And I, and I think um, I have a lot of examples about that. But since we only have a minute or two, any, anybody want to just chime in any final closing comments? Well, my final thought is that we need to shift from a, we need to move into a culture of agility. We need to empower, upskill, reskill our internal folks to make sure that they are able to move from thought to thought from place to place concept to concept we want to build that 
agility to be able to meet current business needs and to be able to grow inside the organization. So to me, keyword of the year is agility. Awesome. Savannah, any closing comments? I think this is, uh, we're still figuring this out for, for HR, how AI the algorithms and, and all of this new technology can impact us. And I think these discussions are important for us to keep our commitment to HR as a profession. Awesome. Lauren? I agree. We are in phase one of a very exciting and to the subject or, or title of today's event. You know, we are, we are transforming and it and the, and the people. And as long as we keep that in mind, forward. We're in phase one and we'll see what phase two brings us. I love it. Thank you all for your Thank you all. comments and contributions. I turn it back to our MC. Excellent. Well, thank you guys so much for such an incredible and insightful panel discussion. I also want to thank everyone for joining us today. This session, along with all today's content, will be made available on demand following the event. Our next session will begin shortly at 1225 Eastern, which will be a thought leadership titled Winning with Wellbeing, What Employees Really Think and How AI Gives HR a Competitive Advantage. We look forward to seeing you there. Thank you all so much again.